24 in Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. And it reads this. Shh. <laughs> Shh. No, um, I will say when it comes, I, I, um, I really am not that strict when it, uh, talking in church, I'm zoned out really when, if there's any kind of chatter going on, I'm really not aware of it. I will say that I do have, you know how everybody kind of has a pet peeve. Mine is when somebody's talking and the, and the word of God is being shared, like out of the scripture, it really does bother me. I'm just letting you know so we get to know each other. <laughs> uh, so, and that's why I'll be really strict if. I'm like, when I say everybody stand, let's read the scripture together. If there's talking, then I probably would stop and just say, hey, could you please respect the reading of God's word? Um, but that's, that's kind of really it. I don't, it doesn't, you know, other things don't bother me as much. But, um, but Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. It reads, and they, over, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. The testimony, of course, is a very, very powerful. You didn't have to stand, but I, I appreciate you just stand. <laughs> Y'all getting scared now. <laughs> Y'all are funny. Hey, is, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the testimony, you could be seated. The, the testimony is, is a powerful, uh, powerful uh, uh, gift from God that God gives you. It's what God has done in your life, right? It's, it's how the hand of God has worked. And when you go to the court of law and you stand before the judge and before the jury, uh, if you get up there and you say, well, I can tell you somebody else's story. I can give you a second-hand account. It doesn't have the same effect. In fact, it won't even hold up in court. It's not even evidence in the court of law, right? But whenever you go to court and you give a first-hand account of what God has done for you, the courts consider that as evidence. They consider that as law, right? And so that's why it's so important that we go and tell the world and tell each other the first-hand account of what God has done in our life. It's powerful. It has a powerful impact. But then secondly, it's also a worship unto God. And God does things in your life so you'll acknowledge him, right? He does things in your life so you'll know that he is God. Right? That is part of your worship. It's just as big a uh, part as you singing a song unto him. It's just as big as you praying. It's just as big as you doing some type of service in the church. Giving testimony and acknowledging what God has done for you is powerful for your life. It's powerful for those who are listening to your testimony. And it's also powerful uh, for, uh, for your worship unto God. And through it, we overcome. Amen. We overcome in life. And so we're going to start these first Sunday night a month times where we come together and we just testify. And they may look different every time. I don't want it to look like a Sunday morning. I want it to be a different service, right? And so sometimes in Christendom, we think a worship service all has to look the same. And we will have singing. We will have times of praying. We will have a, a, a preach message tonight, a word tonight. Uh, but tonight, what I want you to do, though, is to just really focus on giving that testimony, listening to these stories, listening to the firsthand accounts of what God has done in people's lives. How this is going to work is we're going to, we're going to sing a song. The, the worship team is going to sing a song to you. You're going to worship along with us. And then Brother Thomas Hughes is going to come forward and share a story, a testimony of what God has done, a firsthand account of what God has done in his life. And it's powerful. It's a powerful story. I've already heard it. I said, Brother, you've got to share this. The people have got, people have to know what God has done in your life. And then we'll do another song. And then I've asked my daughter, Bella, to testify for what God has done in her life. And, uh, and then following that, there will be, we'll do another song, uh, and then Erin Espinosa will come and share what God has done in her life. And then after that, I'm going to have an open mic and give you the opportunity uh, to share if you'd like to give uh, a brief testimony. If you don't want to give a brief testimony and you're listening to the stories tonight and you're saying, hey, I want to give, a, I want to give you know, a much more extended, detailed testimony, then we're going to have another one of these services, and, and we're going to give you the opportunity to do that again, or if God, like, I'll tell you this morning, I'm going to testify that God healed my knee. I know 100% 
fat that got here Monday. Friday, I was walking up to the senior adult luncheon up those stairs, and I was crying all the way up. I really literally wasn't crying, but I felt like crying uh, up those stairs. And then I just prayed, God, you've got to heal me. And literally, I just walked up the stairs. Still, no pain. I don't, it, it Actually, my knee feels better than it's ever felt. I know God heals. I know God did that work, right? And so I'm testifying about it because I'm telling the devil, don't you even try to come close to my knee again because I'm healed. I'm healed. God has fixed this knee of mine. So that's what we're going to do tonight. So that's how the format's going to flow. But then again, you know how this church works, <laughs> right? Things may happen differently, right? Things may happen differently. These altars may be full, and if the Spirit of God goes in a different direction, we are always going to go in a different direction. And after, uh, after we hear from our guest speaker tonight, uh, then uh, we're going to dismiss, and we're going to have a time of fellowship with uh, different soups and sandwiches and, and, and goodies. So let's go ahead and go. I'm going to ask the worship team to get in place here. Let's just, uh, let's just begin tonight by going to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this night that you've given us, Jesus to be able to come together in your name to testify to what, to what you have done, to what you have done. Father, you have been good to us. You have been so, so good to us. And Lord, I just want to thank you right now. Already, I know things are going to be said tonight. You're going to be lifted high tonight. I just pray, I pray, pray this One, with me, two. church. Pray that God will be lifted so much higher in our life, even more than he was this morning, even more than he was yesterday. God, I desire for you to be lifted so high to become greater in my heart and my mind than you've ever been, Jesus. Lord, I pray that a story will come forward tonight. Something will be shared that will change my life forever. Something will build me up. Something will encourage me something will uh, drop a direction in my life that I need Jesus Lord tonight speak to me God use one of these stories Lord to encourage me tonight I pray I don't want to leave here the same Lord tell them that church say God I don't want to leave here the same I want to be different I want to be changed when I leave here tonight I want to have greater faith in you Jesus I want to have the type of faith that prays the biggest prayers that I've ever prayed in my life help us tonight Jesus spirit of God we welcome you in this house Move in might, move in power, rebuke us, encourage us, correct us, guide us, whatever you have to do, Spirit of God. Have your way tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's all stand, and I encourage you tonight, sing with all your heart. Sing like you've never sung before. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Oh, just one more note. When you come forward and testify, you just come, come down here on the floor and, and testify, so you don't have to walk up those steps.
work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, waymaker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Say that again, waymaker. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work, a promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, a promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You are good. Hallelujah. Yes, thank God. you, thank Hallelujah. you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right, I got a testament I want to tell you guys. Uh, I died about four years ago. God brought me back alive. And uh, I was asking God, I said, well, Lord, I said, what do you want me to do? You want me to be a preacher? He said, no. He said, I don't. I got plenty of them out there. He said, but what I want you to do, he said, I want you to tell my children to stop smoking, which I'm thinking, I used to smoke myself, and I'm thinking that he brought that to my attention because I was passing out. I could be standing up here just like I'm standing up here talking now. Before I knew it, I started coughing, and I would pass out. So I didn't question God. And so his son said, well, you want me to bury him? He said, no, not now. He said, I got something I want him to do. So after he told me that, he said, well, I'm going to bring him back. And he blowed his narcissist in my mouth. I could see the smoke coming through my mouth. They were trying to put some, a cabinet in my mouth, you know, to bring me back. But anyway, he didn't bring me back. The narcissist brought me back. Uh, not, uh, so I said, well, I said, Lord, I said, why did you bring me back? He said, I brought you back because I want you to tell my children to stop smoking. I went around, I told a whole horse story. I said, God told me to tell you guys. I said, if y'all didn't want to listen to me, y'all got to give in count of me. And I said, Lord, look at here. 
then everybody started listening to me, you know, and when I started talking, you know, and stuff. So I went on, I went on, I kept thinking, I kept thinking, I said, well, was I dreaming or what was I doing? Then I heard this on television, other people were going through saying the same thing that I did. They said they went through the same thing that I had to do. So I said, I know I couldn't have been dreaming, so it had to be in God. And right now, up to the day, he comes to me and he let me know a lot of things. Sometimes things are happening to me that I can see it before it happens. And that this, that's it. So that's my testimony. Anybody else want to come and share something God's done in their life? I know Brother Kenny back there, he also was brought back to life. He was dead on the table, right, if I'm not mistaken. And God brought him back to life. We serve a God that raises people from the dead, right? Yeah, go ahead. the Lord before everybody. Well, I want to testify about my husband. The day I went to um, the hospital, <clears throat> it was a Sunday. He was going through a, a lot uh, that year. So usually Sunday, I don't go visit him because I have the kids and children to be in the hospital. So that day, the, the spirit was quickening me. Go see your husband. Go see your husband. So I packed the, both kids up, and we went to the hospital. So when we got there, the kid couldn't go in, so I went in. I went in. He was laying there. You all seen a movie, or if somebody have saw, seen a dead person with a, um, the, the white uh, blanket, all over them, and you, you only have your face, all your hands is in there, no fit out, everything, just the face. So the doctor came, I asked him, what's going on? He said, well, we did everything, and it's nothing else we can do. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, man, I said, but his blood pressure was 157. 150, he had uh, higher blood pressure than this. <laughs> blood pressure of 157, he can lay. He said, man, well, we did everything we could do. I said, okay. And he left. When he left, I had the blood of, um, the, the blessed oil in my, my purse. So I took the blood of uh, the blessed oil, put it on his face, put it on his lips, on the door, uh, on the door, on his bed where he was laying there, and on his on the clock that uh, hey! they pulled on the on the cloth they wrapped him with. The kids couldn't get in to see the dead. I was by myself in there. So when I was done, I was calling him, Mike. Can you hear me? He just said, huh, and go back. Mike, Mike, can you hear me? <laughs> and he goes back. So when I did that, I took my, I took my kid and we, we came back home. I said to myself, God told me he's not going to die. Come on here. <laughs> when I prayed by myself in the house, because he was in the hospital, God tell me he's not going to die. Trust me, he's not going to die. Amen. The following morning, I called back there. Instead of, instead of being in the ICU, they changed his room. He went to an individual room, and he was sitting there eating. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The man who was dying yesterday is eating today in an individual room. And I said, Mike, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine, sweetie. I said, oh, I'm thank you. I thank God I hear your voice. So I want to thank God and tell you guys that God is a healer and he, he raised de de people from the dead.
you see why we don't a lot of times when he sits there and he hollers like he does. Do we get the understanding now? Does if I mean if don't nobody else in this room know who God is, he does. Huh? And he lets you know that. That's why the kind of holler comes out of him. Because the doctors gave him up. But see, they don't have the final say. Ah, but God does. God does. But see, just that, that simple testimony right there, after that, everybody in this room should have that same kind of holler. Why? Because if he did it for him, he can do it for me. We thank you for your goodness. You are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life, and all my life, you have been faithful. And all You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. Oh, I have lived in the goodness of God all my life. And all my life, you have been faithful. And all goodness of God. All my life, and all my life you have been faithful. 
of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Um, I was born with a club foot, and that means my foot was turned in and not flat. Um, my parents were shocked because none of the ultrasounds showed a club foot. Um, one of the nurses who attended our church looked at my dad and said, don't worry, we see these often and her foot will be flat. For the first two years of my life, I was I had four surgeries and had different casts every two weeks. After the fourth surgery, the doctor was frustrated that my foot was not flattening as it should. We then moved to Maine, where I started seeing a Shriners doctor. Um, they specialize in these deformities, and I started another series of casts. We traveled five and a half hours both ways each week to change out casts and to stretch my foot. After six months, the doctor said the casting is only helping a little and that a major surgery would be necessary when I was older. When I was seven, I had a surgery, but the doctor was not satisfied with the result. We later moved to Virginia when I was 12, and we visited a new Shriners doctor in Greenville, South Carolina. After x-rays, images, this after x-ray images, this doctor shared with my parents that there was nothing they could do except to amputate my foot and fit it with the prosthetic so I could walk straight. My parents were devastated. They contacted all their prayer partners to pray for a miracle. The next day, the doctor called my dad to explain to him what he told him, uh, my mom and I. We, he shared that he decided to share my case with a group of doctors just to, um, to see if he was missing something. After consulting this group, they agreed to try one more surgery. I had that surgery this past March, and my foot is finally flat. Now I have a normal, slightly smaller foot. Also, I have had a great recovery and recently made the basketball team at my school. <laughs> I, would, I would like to say thank you, Jesus, for healing my foot. Never give up praying and trusting in Jesus, even when the experts give up on you. Come on. I found out later that the same doctor who said the best option was to amputate is also a strong believer in Jesus. When I went for surgery, a nurse told my dad that he is the only doctor she knows that asks his entire staff to join him in prayer before the surgery. I can't help but to think he prayed for me after he told me the news about amputating and the Lord must have moved him to get another opinion. Thank you, Jesus. And as my dad says, Jesus almost always has something different to say about your problems than what others are saying. because she didn't know all the, the details and the ins and outs. She was a child. Didn't quite understand everything that was going on at the time. Um, but, um, you know, when she got her cast off, <laughs> she hummed after she had that surgery. And I had never seen her have a straight, flat foot uh, since, she, since she ever, you know, when she was born. And, man, I, we couldn't believe it. We were shocked when we saw how deformed her foot was. In fact, you know, the doctors had said that, it was different than other club feet because um, it was just so much that was wrong. It was so mangled, um, and it was just in bad shape. Um, but that nurse, she told us, a uh, friend of ours, and she just said, God's going to heal this. God's going to heal We held on to that promise. We held on to that promise. And, uh, and you know, you've got, to, you've got to find a promise from the Lord and hold on to it, even when it seems like he's not working, he's working. Even when he doesn't feel like he's working, he's working. 
Um, he never stops working, and uh, and and she's gonna play basketball, and she's gonna do good. Amen. 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 Anybody else? Anybody else? Before we go to another song, want to testify? Yes, yeah, Sister Arlene. Now, I had not shared with him that I thought I was dying. I just didn't share, you know, we didn't come up and I just talked about it. He said, can I pray with you? And I said, who tells your pastor no, especially this one. So I'm like, sure. And he starts praying and he, he says, Lord, I know you're not finished with her yet. Amen. Come on. Amen. Lord, I know there's work for her to do. That's right. Lord, it's not her time. I know it's not her time. He said, and Lord, I need her. Amen. And you know when he said those words, it was like blood started flowing in through my veins. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. You know, you know these things. You know you need it. You know you're wanted. You blah, 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 blah. But when he said it, it just started cursing that blood back through my veins. That's right. Amen. And you know what? My blood pressure has been okay. Not where it needs to be, but it's been okay. And they took me off all those extra medicines. And, and you know, I'm just trusting and believing. Because my pastor said, God's not done with me yet. Amen. 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 many of us know that God is a promise keeper. Um, I have many testimonies to share, but I ask God, like, what testimonies could I share? Um, I know him as a healer, a deliverer. I know that he make ways out of no ways. Um, so I wanted to share this and I was about uh, my father. Um, as a little girl, even my mom used to always tell me that I always looked for my dad, you know, he wasn't around. And I was I always looked for him because I seen pictures of him. He was a uh, light-skinned uh, man, handsome man. <laughs> and uh, I was always looked for him, she said, you know, like, oh, is that my daddy? Is that my daddy? Looking for him and stuff. And I remember myself, I always go to bed at nighttime, and I, one of my prayers was to, God, I want to find my dad. Where's my dad? I want to find my dad, you know. Um, and that, that was something that I always prayed for. Um, so um, I went to school, and I was with this girl on the train, and she was like, oh, yeah. She was like, you know, I found my baby dad through Zaba Search. And I was like, what? Zaba Search? I'm like, okay. So I started looking up. I looked up my dad's name, right? I looked it up, and every name that came up, 
it, it also give you like the people that's in his family. So I knew my my stepmom's name. I knew my older brother was Calvin too. So I was I looked them up and I was like, okay, you know what? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write a letter to everybody that's on that list. So I wrote a letter to everybody that was on that list. I got like three calls, you know, before I got to the right call. Then the one call I got, I was on my way to school, I got a call and they was like, uh, my speak Priscilla. And I was like, yeah. They was like, this your sister Nikki. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And my, my phone was a cell phone, so it was no signal. So I, I had her call my house phone, call my house phone, because I couldn't hardly hear. She called my phone, said, can I call my mom? And I called my mom, got on the phone, she called her mom, and we got to talking. And she was like, yeah, this is Linda. And she's like, uh, yeah, this is your sister Nikki that called you, your brother Calvin. He's in, um, he's in, uh, um, what, he was in Texas at the time still. He was in Texas, but, and I was like, where's my daddy? They was like, uh, he's in uh, Tennessee. And I was like, what? I'm like, so I found my dad after all that time. So it goes to that song that even when you don't see him working, he's working. When you don't feel it, he's working, you know. And then that some prayers, I know that we all have prayed before. I always seek. I always kept on seeking like, okay, it, I know he out there. I know he out there. Just like the prayers that we pray all the time that we think that went unanswered. But we serve a faithful God. He, you know, his, pray, his promises are yes and in him, amen. So he answered prayers. You know, it uh, it ended. I mean, I I, talk, I got a chance to talk to my dad on the phone, and didn't get a chance to meet him unfortunately until he was on his deathbed. Two years later, even though I talked to him on the phone, I never saw him face to face until he was on his deathbed. But that was even a blessing. When I got there, I held his hand, and he just looked at me and just cried. He couldn't even really say anything, but he cried, and I just knew he knew who I was, and he was able to go. And a couple of days later, that's when he passed away. But God is good.
you, Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. All right, Aaron is going to come and share. As you know, we've been going through a battle in our life. Um, my family has been going through a financial battle right now. Um, but I want to say, I'm through this battle, I'm learning to put my full trust in him and Come wait on, on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And stand firm in my faith. I may not know the answer, but I know that the answer is on the way Good. because Jesus is with me. Yeah. I think of Peter. When Jesus appeared on the water amidst the storm, he said, fear not, it is I. Peter said, Lord, if it is you, bid me come. Jesus said, come. Peter climbed out of the boat into the storm. He looked at Jesus and began to walk on the waves towards Jesus. But then he took his eyes off of Jesus and looked at the storm and began to sink. Peter cried out, Jesus, save me. Then Jesus reached down his hand and grabbed Peter and pulled him up out of the water. And he walked him to the boat. But Jesus did not calm the storm until they got back in the boat. Meaning, just because the storm is still raging, Jesus will walk with you through it. He said, he will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. When you don't know how you're going to pay your bills or feed your family. First seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. When the devil comes and sits on your shoulder, because he will, and he tells you all these lies to suck you down into a depression or have you panicking, you resist him and you tell him, it is written, God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. Greater is he that is in me than, any, than he that is in the world. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He has made me more than a conqueror. And I shall not be moved. Oh, one more time, give God a hand clap of praise on that. Wow. You know, I uh, when we first got here in February, I guess it was just a few weeks after Aaron and her family had visited church. And I remember meeting Aaron. I remember thinking, man, God's got a plan for that lady. She just looked just beat up and wearied and stuff. Just, you know, life had been getting to like it would anybody. I remember we prayed for her. I even called her. I remember just tried to reach out. And then there was one Sunday I just saw a breakthrough in her life. She has not been the same since. I mean, she obviously that anointing that goes through her has been going through uh, Judy and Becky. It's, I see it flowing in you, Aaron. That's, a, that's powerful. That was a great testimony. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else tonight want to testify what God's doing in your life? Yes, Brother Frank.
That's a true song. That's a true song. Because I know what he have done for me. I was putting four, eight, four stitches, so stents in my body at one time. And we was on a car, Deb and I, at 80 miles an hour. 80 miles an hour I was hit. Did the air flag blow? No. You know why? Because if they would have blown, the doctor said it would have killed me. But you know what? The best thing I always do say is this. That God put all of y'all in my life. Amen. And I can say this from the bottom of my heart. I'm glad I met all of you. All the way up there. All the way up there. Amen. So one that I have is actually about my wife. Well, like she said, she has many. Um, but God has uh, brought her back to us more than once. Um, so, but this one was when um, she was diagnosed with a tumor in her belly. It was literally the size of a football. And it, when you would put your hand on her stomach, it would literally move somewhat like a baby would move. And that's how you would feel it in there um, because it was that big, you know. And so uh, she went to one year the women's retreat. And um, if I'm getting this right, they were um, in the pool, right? Was it in the, what, what was happening? It was worship. Worship was happening. She was prayed for, right? And she didn't feel it anymore. And so, but when she came home, she was even, look, feel, this, can you feel it? And no, couldn't feel it. But she was still supposed to go for the procedure. So when she went for the procedure, they, uh, well, the doctor, first they came into the room. Now this, this I, will, I will never forget. They came into the room and they, you know how the anesthesiologist comes see you and all those people come see you. And he asked her one in the, I mean, room full of people. He said, well, ma'am, do you trust me? She said, no. I looked at her like, what did you just say? She was like, no. I trust God. <laughs> he said, well, okay, yeah, okay, all right. So we prayed, and she went in. When they came back out, and they told us that, um, they said, well, we did take something out, but it was the size of, I think, a quarter. Quarter. It was, it was very small, in other words. So, and then, because uh, when we went back to go see the doctor, he said, yeah, um, it was like the size of a quarter. I said, really? And I asked him, so how often does that happen? He said, pretty much never. Almost never happens. It, it doesn't happen. I'm like, really? But she wouldn't let me go on because she knew what I was, where I was going with it, you know. But if I can, real quick, one more testimony about her is that we were on our way to Disney World. I always wanted, we always wanted to go, but we allowed the kids to go with my family because she was sick that, uh, that night. She was, you know, just not feeling good at all. So we went into prayer. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, if you don't feel better within a net, you know, a few hours, we're not gonna go. So after prayer, it got worse. And I mean, to the point to where she was like, okay, look, I can't do it. I can't do it, we gotta go to the emergency room. I said, okay, let's go. We got to the emergency room, they looked over and everything. And they called, I guess, a specialist down and he came and he said, we are going to surgery right now, right now. She has to have emergency surgery. So I'm thinking like, what in the world is happening? You know, cause they didn't really explain much for us cause they had to get her up there that fast. So later when they came back after everything was over, they, uh, the doctor came and told me and her mom, he said, listen, Mr. Knox, had you not wouldn't have got her, her here last night or, and, or had you would have went to Disney World, he said, you, would have been the only one coming back. He said she had a bowel blockage and it was going to back everything up and it was literally going to go through the rest of her body and poison her and kill her within days, you know. So basically, and, and I mean, you talk about him being a healer. You talk about him being a way maker. Yes. 
you talk about, I mean, it's, but it's, it's, it's all truths. It's all truths. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So now, as we go through things, you know how when we go through something, most of the time you can't tell? You know why? Because we've already given it over. We've already given it over. God is like this. He'll, he tells us, this is what he tells us to do. Cast your cares, right? But this is what we do. God is saying, reach for the mic. Give it to me. What are we doing? Yeah. What can he do with this? Nothing. Why? <clears throat> because you won't take your hands off of it. He can't fix it. He can't mold it. He can't do anything with it if you don't let it go. Sitting in here, he's putting it on, uh, on, on me that it's, it's a lot of us sitting in here with a lot of stuff on us that we ain't letting go. And you know what's, what's, what's funny about that? Even though all the things that he's done for us is big or was big, do you know sometimes I have a hard time trusting him with little stuff? Yeah, even me. After all of that big stuff he's brought us through, sometimes I still, like, go to him in prayer like, God, uh, are you going to do this? You know, I mean, it's been a little while. I'm just wondering, you know, just if you can send me a sign or something, give me a little please. You know, let me know. But how, how am I going to doubt him now? After all of those things that he's done, how in the world? And I doubt him now. Not to infringe on what they're going to talk about, but in the recovery group, do you know how, uh, um, I guess I could say refreshing this is? I didn't know how much I needed it. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm flat out honest. I didn't know how much I needed it until one night I told her, I don't feel like going back. I'm, I don't feel like going to, to the recovery tonight. Y'all go ahead. I'm just going to chill here. I'm tired. Until she was like, really? No, you need to go. And I went. And I didn't understand how much I needed to have been there that night. Because it literally helped me. Because, see, I thought that I was physically tired. But actually, I was emotionally tired. Mm. And it helped me sitting there going through that. So I'm done. I'm, I don't want to take up too much no, more time. That's great. I appreciate it. That was a good uh, preview. But I want to go ahead and invite uh, Jack and Cindy Gans to come forward. They're going to uh, come and share a, a message with. Oh, Kenny, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were headed down. Come on down. No, come on, brother. Come on. No. Yeah, thank you. You guys can come too. <laughs> I definitely got a lot to be thankful for. And I wouldn't be standing here for today if it wasn't for this church praying for me back in June of 2018. Me and my daughter had gone to a festival on June 3rd, and I was having trouble breathing. So that Monday, I took her to school, and after school, I picked her up. And she's like, Dad, you're not getting any better. We need to go to the emergency room. So off we went, went to the emergency room. And we're in there, and they're doing all these tests, and they realize that I got pneumonia. But at the same time, they see I have a hernia. So for some reason, the doctor was so worried about the hernia that the next day they wanted to do surgery. So they did the surgery the next day, and when they went to take me out of, or put me in recovery, I, I flatlined. I wouldn't wake up because I couldn't breathe. And they did that three different times. And I flatlined each time. So then they finally put me on life support. And here I am at South Suburban Hospital. My sister somehow, I don't know how they got a hold of her. How it all went down, because obviously I, I wasn't conscious enough to know. But she had to make a decision to get me out of that hospital. Otherwise, I would have died. So she had me transferred to Christ Hospital. So where I spent now, this was uh, 
June 4th, they did the surgery June 5th. She had me moved on June 7th to Christ, and they were doing, I was in a coma. They had me on life support. On June 9th, they called my family phone. I was probably next to me, next to me. <laughs> Day before Emma birthday. So, but I, I made it. Every, you know, I got all kinds of people praying for me from all different states, from here, everywhere. So come Father's Day weekend, the day before they were going to take me off the machine, I have one day, and then they call you off the life support and whatever happens, happens. In the state of Illinois, you're only allowed to be on it 15 days. Well, on the 15th day, I woke up. today and this church has done a lot for me. Amen. They've taught me what my faith is in humanity because it was really bad and we're just getting better and better each and every day. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. attacking me because when I was like little little I was raped and then um, we had moved to Springfield and then when I was in Springfield it was like every school I went to I was getting talked about bullied all that and like I had developed depression in the middle of like middle school and so, like, my life, it was, like, I felt like nobody was really there, and, like, I felt, like, alone, and I had nobody, but, like, the only person I knew I had was my mom, so, like, I would always be up under her and always be around her, so, then I got to high school my freshman year. Both of my parents died, and when my dad, my dad died first, when he died, I was blaming God. I was just like, God, why are you always doing this to me? Like, what did I do wrong? Like, what did I do? And I was just crying my eyes out for, like, every night for a week straight. And I just started going back to school, trying to do my best to get my grades back up. And then next thing you know, my mom passed. Around that, when my mom passed, that was when I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna let it go. I'm, I'm gonna give you my life. And when I moved in with my godparents, well, when I started being around my godparents, they really brought me and had me understanding God and like understanding that I'm going through this for a reason. I well, I, I was going through it for a reason and. Uh, Things that happen in my life is for a reason to help other people, and yeah. Amen. 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 I think it's so important that you, everybody share these testimonies, but especially if a young person says they want to share, I'm not. I'm never going to deny a young person uh, from sharing because. Um, they, that you don't want them to forget what God has done for them, right? I don't want anybody to forget what God has done for them, but especially our young people. Uh, and so, uh, so we'll take as long as we need to. Um, but did you guys want to share? Supporting him. All right.
testimony is that for the last few weeks, God has been preparing me for the time of separation from him. supposed to have church today because I was so caught up in my other ministry. But this morning, like everybody else, the issue dropped me off. So I was preparing you for the new thing. I just want to say how proud I am, so proud of our young people, so proud of your willingness to share about what God is doing. We love you guys so much, and I just see your faith in God growing. I feel your love for God growing. Prentice, you know, the Lord has so many good things. Well, you, everybody knows that about you. I hope you believe that about yourself, that God has so many wonderful things he's going to do in and through your life. You're, you're such a special guy. I love you so dearly. Amen. Amen. Um, listen, we're going to do this the first Sunday of every month. So, you know, if you've got something you want to share, be thinking about it. Be thinking about how you want to encourage the congregation, about how you want to give worship to God. But I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Jack and Cindy. And uh, Pastor Stephen already kind of introed it a little bit of what they're doing. They're helping us to start a Celebrate Recovery group here at this church, they're meeting on the fir on the on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. for what they call a step study, preparing a group that eventually we will launch a a regular weekly celebrate recovery meeting where there will be a testimony and then there will be a um, uh, and then the following week will be a teaching. 
Uh, so, uh, so this is, again, you see that you've experienced the power of the testimony tonight. That's why a group like Celebrate Recovery is so powerful because you hear these testimonies frequently. I know they're going to talk a little bit about it. I don't want to take a lot of their time. They are from uh, Hammond uh, New Harvest Church, uh, Church of God, uh, ordained ministers. Uh, but the most important thing you need to know about them is, is that Cindy is the, the daughter of Violet. So <laughs> that's not the most important thing, but that's a very important thing, right? And so we're all big fans of Violet, so we're all big fans of Cindy and Jack, too. <laughs> uh, but let me go ahead and turn it over to them. Thank you guys for being here tonight. You come up on stage if you'd like. Yeah. Amen. Whew. You feel the Holy Spirit in this place? I do. I, I, what, what, what's, what's, what's your name, young man? Prentice. Prentice? You know what I feel the Lord to tell you? He's setting you apart. He's setting you apart for the anointing that he has. And he's going to restore a hundredfold. Come on. Those friends you think you lost, God's going to, he's going to restore it a hundredfold with, with godly men and women in your life because he has a special call and a special anointing. So that pain you're feeling right now, he's going to turn that into beauty and, and, and use it for his glory. So you, you press in, you press in. God is good. He is good. Ooh. I had to share that. Um, as most of you know, um, my name is Cindy Gans. This is my husband, Jack Gans. Uh, Pastor did do an introduction. Um, so I just wanted to, yes, I'm Violet's youngest daughter. I actually grew up in this church. Um, so this was my, it, it wasn't this large. It was that little building over there. Um, so uh, some of you, I know Clarita was around, and, and I, I had to, to pay her to be quiet about some things. No, I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> she knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm, um, but it, it is a privilege to be. So I, I just quickly want to um, talk a little bit about how we got here, and then I'm going to turn it over to my husband, and he's going to tell you a little bit about this program called Celebrate Recovery. Um, so just so you know, one, one Saturday, uh, my husband and I had been involved in Celebrate Recovery and in leadership recently for about, about three years, and we recently went into leadership in, in the program. Um, and so one Saturday, uh, my mom had been telling me about this cat that apparently loved to hang out at the church here, and she had a lot of compassion for, and uh, we were coming to get this cat. I had no idea that anything was going on at the church, um, but when I came to look for this cat, uh, the pastor and a few others were here. You had an event where you were giving out things, uh, blessing your community. And, and I had met the pastor before very quickly, um, and we entered into a very short conversation, um, and we began to, to share, and I began to share about Celebrate Recovery. Um, and he just let me know that the Lord had laid that program on his heart. And we instantly had a connection. And, and, and it wasn't long after that we connected and he talked to Jack and I about coming and starting a program here and helping start that. Um, your pastor shared his heart. We shared a common, a common interest. And that was to bring a message of hope. See, his heart is to see God move and to build the broken. Come on, to build the broken. To create a culture in your church of building the broken. And what I have learned, being broken myself, is that in order to build the broken, we have to start here. We have to start within. How many of you know we're all broken? We're all broken. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. We're all broken. We struggle. We carry scars, whether those are internal or external. We all struggle with something. And that's why my husband and I said we would come and help with this program we call Celebrate Recovery. So Jack's going to give you a few details about the program, and then I'd like to, to share a little bit more of what the Lord laid on my heart for you. Good evening. So, as far as I'm concerned, this is a very good program. And uh, like I said, like my wife said, we've been going for... About three years now, the church out in Crown Point, and uh, basically, I started going to help to support my wife. And then after a while, I was like, "Wow!" You know, listening to some of the other men at some of the groups, I was like, "Well, 
Well, that's probably a good reason why I'm here, because I did what he did. <laughs> and I did what he did. So God just pulled me in here and uh, touched my life. And I want to read some of this to you, and hopefully it'll touch your life also. So the Bible clearly states, all have sinned. It is my nature to sin, and it is yours too. None of, us, none of us is untainted. Because of sin, we are all hurt ourselves. We've all hurt other people, and others have hurt us. This means each of us needs repentance and recovery in order to live our lives the way God intended. <clears throat> You've undoubtedly heard the expression, time heals all wounds. Unfortunately, that isn't true. As a pastor, I frequently talk with people who are still carrying hurts from 30 to 40 years ago. The truth is, time often makes things worse. Wounds that are left unattended fester and spread infection throughout our entire body. Time only extends the pain the problem isn't dealt with. What we need is a biblical and balanced program to help each overcome their hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Celebrate Recovery is this program. I have seven points here. I believe that this program is unlike any other recovery program you may have seen. There are seven features that make it unique. Number one, Celebrate Recovery is based on God's word, the Bible. Number two, Celebrate Recovery is forever look, looking. Number three, Celebrate Recovery emphasizes personal responsibility. Four, Celebrate Recovery emphasizes spiritual commitment to Jesus Christ. Five, Celebrate Recovery utilizes the biblical truth that we need each other in order to grow spiritually and emotionally. Celebrate Recovery addresses all types of habits, hurts, and hang-ups. And finally, number seven, Finally, Celebrate Recovery is a leadership factor because it is biblical and church-based. Celebrate Recovery produces a continuous stream of people moving into ministry after they found recovery in Christ. Basically, that's what Celebrate Recovery is all about. And if you go through the program, I believe that it will help every person that does. Yes, amen. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to share just a couple of minutes uh, with you um, a, a little bit about my, our walk in Celebrate Recovery. As Jack said, um, we went to Celebrate Recovery. We were invited um, from a family member who, who does struggle and, and, and introduced us to this program. When we first started attending, uh, we were going thinking, yeah, well, let's see what this is like, and, and maybe we can start one up at Hammond in our church. Uh, we liked the program, we experienced the program, but we came in with a mindset of, we're going to start this somewhere else. I came in with a mindset of, I've been forgiven, and I have, praise God, we've been forgiven, right? Um, our sins are as far as the east is from the west, we've all heard that, right? Um, but when I, when I got into the program and I really began to follow the steps, because Celebrate Recovery has 12 steps and 8 principles, and it, it's biblically, biblically based, it's based on the Beatitudes, um, but when I got, when I, when I really began to read and study, I started to find that I needed that program more than it needed me. And let me tell you why. Um, I don't know how many of you are struggling with the promises of God, but I've been waiting on a promise from God for a long time. And I've been in a battle. My husband and I have been in a battle for a very long time. 
And as a minister of the gospel, as a pastor, I was going into the church on Sunday morning wearing my mask, wearing my mask every Sunday. The mask that says, when someone says, how are you? I'm blessed and highly favored. And I am. I am blessed and highly favored, but I was also hurting. I was also at a point where I was questioning God. I was at a point where I was questioning my faith. I could stand up and minister the word on a Sunday and tell you about trust, and I could tell you about faith, and I could tell you about Jesus. But the night before, I was on my face saying, God, are you even real? Are you even real? Do you even exist? Why am I in such pain? Why haven't your promises been fulfilled? And I struggled. I struggled. You know, being raised in a Pentecostal church, nothing against a Pentecostal church, but what I have found is we often come in and we wear a mask. And it's difficult for us to look inside. The Bible tells us, and we know this in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We believe that. We've heard that. We've saved. We give our heart to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is true. We know this. This is salvation. This is the word. This is the gospel. We are forgiven. We're new creatures. Yes, we're forgiven, and our sins are as far as the east is from the west. But the truth is, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. And sometimes we forget. After we've given our heart to the Lord, that's not it. One of the things we have to do and we have to continue to do as, as, as children of God is to disciple disciple others see it's more than just the confession yes thank god we are on our way to heaven our sins are forgiven and we love jesus but there is discipleship that goes along with it and and, and that's the one thing that was very difficult to, for me to be transparent to say i had thoughts of i just want my life to be done because this pain was so great the pain i was dealing with was so great pastor I just felt like, you know what, I don't want to get up and go through this again. I don't want to feel this pain again. I had those thoughts, but yet I'm ministering to others on a Sunday morning. And I was hurting, and it was deep. You see, the thing is, the Bible tells us that the enemy, in John 10.10, 10, that the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that he says, Jesus said, see, there's so much more. He said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. See, that's the thing I was missing, that more abundant life. What I didn't realize is that I had Fear that was beyond, I didn't know I was bound by fear, but I was bound by fear. I was bound by fear because I was trying to control a situation. I was terrified that something was going to happen to the person that I love, and I was trying to control it, and I was obsessed with knowing. I had to know that they were okay. I was bound by fear, and the enemy was stealing my peace, my rest, my joy, he was stealing it. Anxiety and fear were something I lived with, but I suppressed it so well under that. I'm afraid that if I admit this, they're not going to think I'm holy enough. They're not going to think that I am worthy to minister. If I show them that I'm hurting on this level, they're not going to think I'm a good Christian. And the Lord began to deal with me and celebrate recovery because the first thing it, it says is that we have to realize we're not God. We walk in, 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 we walk in denial. We have to realize we're, we're not God. And, that, and that's the one issue for me was like I was trying to be everyone else's savior. So what I, I learned was that I have a codependent enabler and I have some issues that I need to deal with. But when the enemy comes, see, Jesus came. He came for more than salvation. That's the start. But he says, he says in Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. 
That's us sometimes. We're brokenhearted. He came so that we would be healed, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to recover the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Look, church, there are times when we're going through some stuff. We're hurting, we're questioning, we're wondering, we're bound by something, fear, anxiety. There, sometimes it's our health, sometimes it's a spirit of infirmity. Sometimes we're struggling with some things, and, and you know what? There could be times we don't even realize. Mark 4, 22, 23 says, For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, the Lord began to deal with me, and we hear this often in Celebrate Recovery, I'm as sick as my secrets. See, the enemy, what he can do is if you haven't been able to testify and overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony, if you haven't been able to get up and say, this is what I've struggled with, this is what I'm dealing with, then the enemy can whisper in your ear and say, oh, do you remember when you did that? Do you remember this? Or he grips you with such anxiety and such fear and doubt and insignificance. Pride, guilt, shame. Another thing that I've noticed that we struggle with is a judgmental attitude. I'm going to be real tonight because pastor is going to have to deal with anything I say that you don't like later. <laughs> a judgmental attitude. This is something that, that God had really get a hold of me. And Bruce, tell me, you, you have a judgmental attitude. I could look at someone and I'm thinking something that I shouldn't be thinking. You know, there's a story in the Bible about the woman at the well. Do you know that Jesus went? He didn't have to go there through Samaria, but he went there just for her. And do you know that as she was living a life that many of us would have went, oh, it's her. You know, she's, you know, we're not going to be able to, you know, she's, she's been married how many times now? Yeah, you know, she's, she's. I'm going to give up. We're, 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 you know, but not Jesus. Jesus met her at the well. He didn't go there to convict. He, he didn't go there to condemn her. She was convicted, but she wasn't condemned. She mattered to him. And I said, Lord, forgive me. See, I want and I believe your pastor's heart and May's heart is that this church will be filled with those who others have given up on, who others have said, I'm done, I give up, they're a lost cause, there's nothing we can do. There's some of you out there right now that are praying for a prodigal, and you're thinking to yourself, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. There's some of you out there that have been struggling with illness, and you're thinking, it's never going to happen. There's some who are struggling with the promises of God that you've been holding on for so long, and you really think it, it's, it's not going to happen. It's not gonna, it's, some of you have been told, just, just cope with it. Just cope with it. But can I encourage you tonight? And I, I mean, this isn't just celebrate. I'm going to get back to celebrate. Can I encourage you about something tonight? If someone has told you to cope with something, if someone has told you to accept something that's less than the promise that God's given you, or, or listen, go to the word. And if, if that situation does not line up with the word of God, then you do not cope. You continue in hope. And what you do is you get into that word and you profess and claim the word of God into that situation. Because if it doesn't look like what the Bible says it's supposed to look like, then it's not the will of God. So if someone's, if, if you're settled, if you've settled for less than what God's promised you, I want to encourage you today. Don't settle. Don't settle. Don't settle for the crumbs when God has a feast. He has a table set, a, set out for you. Don't settle. Don't compromise and don't give up. Don't give up on God's promises. So let me get back to what I was dealing with. I was dealing with fear. I was dealing with anxiety and doubt. I was dealing with the judgmental attitude. This was brought about in Celebrate Recovery. And why was it brought about there? Because in Celebrate Recovery, the way this works is you have a testimony and you have a lesson. 
One night you have a testimony, the next night you have, the next week you have a lesson. And then you get into small groups. And when you get into those small groups, it's an opportunity for you to open up and talk about the lesson and talk about the testimony you just heard. So when you hear, like we heard tonight, those coming up and, and testifying, you're hearing them overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And when you hear their testimony, you can look within and say, yes, I get it. I, I can do this. I, can, I want the healing that they have. And, you know, some of us, uh, we have wounds. We all have wounds. We have mommy, daddy wounds. Come on. We have church wounds. I've got some church wounds from right here in this church. We have church wounds. We have mommy, daddy wounds. We have things that have happened to us that we, that we carry. And it makes us who we are today. We may not see it act or react but 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 let me let me say some let, let me just give you a couple quick ones and, and a couple more things to say and I'll I'll be quiet how about you I have to raise my voice to get my point across I become impatient easily when things do not go according to my plans when I am displeased with someone I may shut down any communication with them or withdraw entirely I am annoyed easily when others don't appear sensitive to my needs or convictions. I do not easily forget when someone does me wrong. You ever deal with any of those? Because if you do, you might have an anger problem. Yeah, maybe. There's some things that have happened to us. And there's children in the room, so I'm not going to go into detail. But some things have happened to us, some adult, thing, adult things that have happened to us when we were children. God wants to heal those wounds. He wants to heal those wounds. Another one is maybe you assume responsibility or the, uh, for the feelings or other for, for others' feelings or behaviors. Maybe you feel, feel guilty about others' feelings and behaviors. Maybe you have difficulty identifying or expressing your feelings. Maybe you minimize, alter, alter or deny how so, how you truly feel. Maybe you worry about others and and. and and their behavior, or you value their opinions and their feelings more than your own. Maybe you, you're afraid of being hurt or rejected. You might be codependent. There's, there's several hurts, habits, and hang-ups. All of us have it. And that's what this program is designed to do. It's designed to bring healing. And we get together, and we're real, and we're raw. Okay? Pentecostal, speak in tongues. Yes, I believe in it. Yes, I do. I believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in all of it. But I also know that we are still broken. <laughs> and God wants to heal every part of us. So I know there may be some skeptics, and I get it, and I understand, because we think, well, we're forgiven. I don't want to dredge up the past. I don't want to go back there. Yes, we are forgiven. But we still need healing. And let me just give you a few examples in the Word of God. Abraham and Sarah. Can't get more close to the Lord than Abraham, right? Father Abraham, right? But did, did, what did they try to do? They tried to make God's promises come on their own, right? They tried to fulfill, and then, then we see the story, right? They, they, they pushed it in their own human will and ended up having a son, but that's not the one that God promised. You see what I'm saying? They loved the Lord, right? But they were still trying to control and manipulate. Moses stuttered, right? And he says, no, not me. I, I stutter. One of my favorites is Saul, King Saul. You see, in the, in the Bible, Saul and Samuel, we see this exchange. And, and, and Samuel is telling Saul, you're the one, right? You're the one. And, and he anoints him, right? And what does Saul say? He says, I'm the least of the tribes. I'm a Benjamite. I'm the least. Me? I'm the least in my father's house. And we see that later on, he was anointed. But then what happens? They look for their new anointed king, and where is he at? He's hiding. Right? He's hiding with this stuff. See, for Saul, he had this spirit of insignificance. He didn't think that he could measure up, and he was hiding. We struggle with that sometimes. Do you ever think that, that God can't use you, that you're too old, that, that, that God cannot use you for whatever reason? My past is terrible. I've made so many mistakes. I, God, 
You think you're insignificant? No, no, you're not. God still has a plan for you and you matter and he has a purpose for you and the enemy wants to lie to you and tell you that that's not true. But Jesse can use you and it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. He will and can still use you. And then we see, do you ever think about this? You know, later on, Saul, we know that he's a people pleaser, right? He, he, he wants to please people. So what does he do? He, he gets impatient. He doesn't wait on Samuel. He consults a medium. He partial he doesn't wipe out the Amalekites. Partial obedience is still disobedience. And eventually, the anointing is taken from him. How sad. Because, you know, we read about King David, right? Read about King David. But those promises for King David actually would have been for Saul. But the promises ended up with David. So I want to talk real quick about David. Before we move on, back to my story, but in David, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, now this one really got me. You know, there's a story about David and his men, right? And they had been guarding a flock, right? Nabal, you know the story? David and his men had been guarding a flock, this flock. Uh, David, uh, this man Nabal had a wife named Abigail. And David heard that this man was shearing his sheep, and David had been protecting these sheep. So David sent his men and said, hey, can you give us some provisions? Right? Not much, just what you think might be fair. I mean, you're shearing your sheep. You're going to get some money out of this. Can you, can you bless us? We, we, we want to have a celebration. Maybe it's something as simple as a hamburger and fries and a Coke. Not much for a wealthy man, right? Just give us something. Yet the man rejected David's men. Now, when David heard of this, David, David got angry. He learned, he heard of this, and he said, I am going to wipe him out. I am going to kill this man. I'm going to kill, uh, I'm going to wipe out his entire male household. I'm, I'm going to kill them all. Get ready. Get ready. We're going to go. We're going to kill this man, right? Now, here's David. David had spent time with the Lord. David had, had been a shepherd. David is a man after God's own heart, right? We know who David was, right? He loved the Lord. He spends time, and, and, but he's angry because he was rejected. And he's ready to murder. Oh, this whole, wipe this guy out over something of the equivalent of a hamburger and fries. Now, why do you think that is? Why do we think it is? Why was that rejection? Think about it. Here's David out in the field, and even his own father doesn't even think about bringing him in to be anointed king. So David suffered rejection, right? And it flared up. He suffered rejection with his own family. And then here, when he goes right before Goliath, his brothers are saying, go back to the sheep. What are you doing here? You just want to be seen. David rejected again. See, rejection shows up again in David's life. He needs healing. Thank God for Abigail. She comes along and says, you don't want to do this. <laughs> you don't want to do this. You don't want to be known as a murderer. So let me just, once again, the reason I encourage you for this program that God has done in my life, and I'll just give you a couple more things before I close. I had to come to the realization that even though I was in ministry, I was broken and I was hurting and I needed to be freed from some things. I needed to be free from fear. I needed to be free from anxiety. I wanted everything that God had for me, and that's the key. I want to live in his peace, his rest, his joy. I want that peace that passes all understanding. I want to be able to say no matter what's happening, my God is in control. I wanted that. I wanted that freedom. And I'll tell you what, when God has walked me through the steps just in and celebrate recovery, you build up a family of those that understand where you're coming from. You're in a family. You have a sponsor. You have uh, uh, accountability partners. You walk the walk together, and that's what this is about. It's about relationship. It's about walking the walk together. And let me tell you why. We, here's the last part I want to share. I want you to get this in your mind. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants everything. He wants everything everything. You understand what I'm saying? He wants your family. He wants your home. He wants your finances. He wants your peace. He wants your rest. He wants your joy. He wants all of it. He wants it. If he can keep you in these areas of rejection, 
if he can keep you in shame, if he can keep you in doubt, if he can keep you distracted, he can steal from you. But you see, here's the truth. Satan thought when Jesus died and he was buried that that was it. He thought it was over. He thought that was done. Yep, he's crucified, he's done. But what about that third day? What about that third day? Jesus rose, but let me tell you when he rose. See, the enemy just didn't have Jesus now to contend with because Jesus gave his life. Who did he have to contend with now? He had every single person that would ever accept Christ. Now, there's a mighty army, church, and we're part of that mighty army. See, we don't want to let him steal, kill, and destroy us anymore. We need to stand up and recognize who we are in Christ and get out of that bondage. Why? Because others need to hear our story. Others need to hear what we've gone through. Others need to look at us and say, they don't need to come into, when they come into the church and they see this perfection, you know how hard it is for people to walk into a church when, when, when others aren't real and they're wearing a mask? They walk in and they say, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never get there. I'll never get there. I'll never be that. I'll never be able to go up there and speak. We don't, that's not true because every single one of us had to start somewhere. We had something in our lives that God had to heal or deliver us from even after we were saved. And that's what the program does. It brings those things out. See, I, I don't want the enemy to have any, I, I, no more. Because when Jesus came out of that grave, I came out of that grave with him. So I, well, greater is he that is in me, as this young lady said, than he that is in the world. So that means he, Satan doesn't want us to understand the power or the authority that we have. He doesn't want us to understand that. And when you start to get freedom from these things, you can walk in that freedom. You can say the enemy had me in fear and doubt and anxiety to a point of depression, to a point where depression, I didn't want to live anymore. I started thinking I needed medication. My body was messed up. I'm in the hospital. That was all based on fear and anxiety because the enemy had me so bound. I don't want him to have that over me anymore. I want, him, I want the Lord to prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies and anoint my head with oil. And when I walk in and the enemy sits next to me, I can smile at him because there's nothing you can do anymore. I'm free from all of that. And I'm going to overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. So I want to encourage you tonight. You came out of that grave with Christ the same. Jesus said we're going to do more than what he did. The power, the authority, and the anointing of Christ is in us. And we need to walk in it. And when we walk in it, we can minister to others. When we walk in it, we can see others delivered and freed from the things that we struggled with. When we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And there's so much more. There's so much more. There, there is a world out there that needs us. They need us to be real. They need us to be healed. They need us to be ready when they walk in the room. And I would love to see Sauk Village, the, the, this is the town I grew up in, this to be the place when everybody else is forgotten, everyone else is given up. They come in here and we'll take them. We'll love on them. We're going to love them right where they are. No judging, loving them where they are and let God do the work. And that's what this program is designed to do. Love them where they are. And I'm so grateful they loved me where I was. Because it took a while to get through my Pentecostal shell. No offense. <laughs> but it took a while. Why do I have to deal with that? Why do I have to go back and look at that? Because God wanted to heal it. And he wants to use it for his glory. So I, I appreciate you um, listening tonight. There's, there's so much more. But I think now is a good time to turn it back to your pastor. And I just want to thank you all for your patience. I pray that you will pray over this program and support your pastor in it. Amen. Man, thank you, Cindy. Jack and, and Cindy, first off, from a church, we want to say thank you for helping us to, to start this ministry here at the church and just trusting us and uh, just working with us. And, uh, and, and I, like you said, it was a God moment when, uh, when, when uh, Violet wanted the cat. <laughs> And, uh, and church, I'm going to ask you, will you pray for us? Will you pray for this church? We need to, we need to commit this to prayer. This, Satan will come against this ministry uh, so, so, so hard because he wants, he does not want to see people set free because of the testimony. 
because of the power of the testimony. Uh, and so you're going to hear us talk a lot about when you hear that word celebrate recovery, you're going to know what it means uh, because we've talked about it. But also I, we're going to need you to get the word out, get the word out to as many people as possible. There is a place where someone can find hope for their hurts, hangs, hangups, and habits right here in Salt Village. Uh, so you'll be seeing a lot more of Jack and Cindy. I also want to, uh, just before we break out, and, and, and we're going to have a, a meal here after this, uh, we have a family is visiting tonight. Uh, they're our guests, and you, you saw them sitting here in the middle. Amanda is back there. Uh, just say hey to Amanda. I'm not going to give out names because we are on live streaming here, but Amanda brought tonight some children here that are hurting, and they need our love and they need our support. Amanda is helping to, to bring care for them. Rakaya, their relationship that we got through Rakaya. And, uh, and so tonight, um, talk to Amanda. Uh, talk to Amanda to see how you can help these children. But before we do, I want to just pray over this family. I want to pray over Amanda. God, Amanda needs uh, grace and strength right now to deal with what God has put on her plate to deal with. Uh, in any way the church can help and support. Debbie Williams, she walked out, but I want to get you connected to Debbie as well before you leave tonight because she can, she can connect you with some things as well uh, to, to see if we can help in other ways. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to go ahead and bless the food, and after this, make your way uh, to, uh, to grab something uh, to eat tonight before you leave. But Father, we just want to say thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing Jack and Cindy here to uh, to our church, Lord. I mean, we're all the same. We're one church, God. We're one church of God, right? You know, we may meet in different locations, but uh, but you have given them a vision, a calling. You have given this church a local calling, God, and that we're going to work together, Jesus, Lord, to provide a place, God, where people can come who are broken, can know Jesus. They can find the hope and the healing that they need to face whatever they're, they're struggling with, Lord. God, please, Jesus, we beg you, God, please, Lord. Lord, protect this ministry. Protect Jack and Cindy. Surround them, Lord. Surround the others in the groups, Lord, that are going through these step studies that are that are being raised up to kind of help launch this ministry through this local church. For those who are going to come into the ministry, maybe even tonight they heard the story and they're saying, that's what I need. I need to be a part of that, God. For those who are coming into this, Lord. For those who are going to come from the community into this facility, Lord, in order uh, to be ministered to Jesus. And also out of this facility, how other uh, places, other ministries like this are going to be started all around so that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in all these different locations, there is a place for somebody who's struggling, they know they can go to and find another brother or sister in Christ that will pray for them, that will listen to them, that will encourage them, a place where they can find instruction in God's Word, how to face the struggles that they're dealing with, and how to be set free and healed and delivered. God, let us be that church. God, let us, Lord, use us. Please, Father, we pray. We can't do this in our own efforts. Jack and Cindy will even testify. They can't do it. They need a higher power. They need God on high, Lord. They need the power of the Holy Spirit to help them. Please, Jesus, answer this prayer. I know you're answering it, Lord. I know you're answering it. You've already got us to this point. And Father, we just lift up Amanda to you, Jesus. And I don't even know Amanda, but my heart is towards her and towards these children that are in her care. And Father, I know Jesus. I know, I feel the heart of the Father. I know, Lord, you also dearly, dearly, and deeply love these children. And I pray, God, that you will lead us, guide us, as how, as how to show love to this family, how to show love, Lord, to these precious people. Oh, God, I just, I just, oh, Lord, please, oh, Lord, put your loving arms around them, I pray. Help them to feel you so close to them. Let them know, Lord, that they are safe with you, that there is, there is strength and there is peace in you, Jesus. We love you so much. Heal them, God, I pray. Can we just pray? Just say healing in Jesus' name. Heal them, Lord. Heal them, Lord. Heal them, God. Oh, and give Amanda strength. Supply all her needs, Jesus. Supernaturally from on high, we pray that the windows of heaven be open wide and let it rain down all the things that she needs, Jesus. Bless her, God, with good health. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And bless the meal that we're about to partake. Thank you, Lord, for this time of fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Let's fellowship together. Before